All right, welcome back to another episode of Investment Wizards. I have Howard Lindzen, general partner and co-founder of Social Leverage, uh, prolific investor and also, full disclosure, investor in Coifin. Welcome to Investing Wizards, Howard. What's up, my man? What's going on? Uh, I'm wearing a uh, polo shirt today because my dad told me I look like a schlepper in my other videos, so I thought I'd, I'd uh, spice it up a little. It, does, it looks a little bit more like Dick Van Dyke. Oh, yeah? Pajamas. So, I like uh, Dick Van Pajamas, okay. Like if we were to just go to your bedroom right now, there'd be two single beds for you and your wife. <laughs> <laughs> and Those were be- simpler times. Those are sadly, I, sadly, I don't remember what I had for breakfast yesterday but i remember a many funny episodes of dick van dyke yeah okay, i i wkrp I, I, I was just doing a wkrp in cincinnati reference yesterday to somebody in there how did that go in their 40s they were laughing well you know it was about when les nesman threw turkeys out of the uh, helicopter during a traffic report thinking that turkeys you know as a giveaway didn't realize turkeys couldn't fly and uh, they all <laughs> caused, came crashing down caused, caused some damage yeah, cause a little, cause some damage. Got it. Uh, so the old, you know, I was going back to do old sitcoms and no people just didn't even have a reference of what they were. Yeah, you gotta, gotta stick with the uh, current pop culture. Yeah, well, friends suck. Like your, your pop culture isn't that great either. Uh, like my personal or just my generations? Generation. Got it, uh, I think it's pretty good. All right, let's get into it. No one wants to hear me talk about the, the uh, WKRP in Cincinnati. Dick Van Dyke in my pajamas. All right, so I um, always want to start the show with asking uh, people about their investment style. So uh, how, did you, how did you get into investing? Like, What was the first stock you ever bought, and how did you start investing uh, into the stock market? I, the first stock, I was Canadian, uh, bought this uh, beverage I uh, sold a beverage stock called Cana- Clearly Canadian Vancouver Stock Exchange. It was like you shorted it. No, I I bought it. It okay. was, uh, but I bought it. I didn't understand that most stocks round trip. I still don't think you know indexing has maybe changed it a little bit because if you S and P index, you don't own stocks to zero, right? They get they get one good thing about the indexing. As much as I hate indexing, is that they, you they don't remove. You, you don't own. You end up owning all the biggest companies, which is, you know, kind of a, a jerry-rigged phenomenon of the, how big they become, but you don't end up stocks owning to zero. So that's why I do believe in indexing at some level. Um, the But the stock went to zero. It was a high-flying Canadian beverage stock, and uh, I think I lost three to five K, and my broker made his commission. I thought that's how the stock markets work. So I don't think I made another investment until I was in my 20s. Why did it go to zero? I'm not, I don't know. I, I called my broker, waited 20 minutes, and he would give me quotes every two, three days. <laughs> <laughs> and he never told me to sell. So I, I, yeah, uh, I, I don't think I had enough money to buy more, luckily. So I just lost, I don't know, three, three to 5K is what I remember. Got it. And, and so you, after that, after that horrible experience, you still came back and. I came back not because of, uh, never was into the stock market. Um, my mom, when my parents got uh, divorced, uh, I was in college and yeah, I'm Canadian. And I think that that shaped me, right? Because my mom had a certain set of money and I was the son and it was a messy divorce. And um, my mom didn't give a shit about, like she didn't know what anything. I had, she had been one of those housewives of the time that didn't know anything about anything and the lawyers were running up the bill. I'm in college trying to party and, uh, you know, do mushrooms and I'm like, have to deal with her money. And so that shaped the risk profile that I, mean, I don't think people really understand that, you know, it's not, you can't, you can't, it's very hard to change your risk profile when certain, certain things are said. So I was, I was, a, you know, Canadian conservative meets 20 year old. Uh, if I don't manage this properly, I'll be supporting my mom for the rest of my life. And it wasn't like some ungodly amount of money. So, uh, and I had my life to, to, to start. And I, I, I was so scared of handing that money off to somebody because, you know, if someone blew the money, I'd be in charge. So it kind of shaped me for the good and the bad of like even today, because in the end, the money has run out and I do support her, but uh, we, we, 
So you have, so not only do I have the drama of managing, oh, you know, my own life, I'm like for 40 years was trying to make sure she didn't run out of money, uh, which was almost an impossible task. Unless I had just bought Apple. So, you know, you have remorse over like not taking more risk uh, because I wouldn't have had to worry. She would have been rich. So I just didn't know enough and didn't, you know, in your formative college years, you're not going to study the market. Well, at least I wasn't willing to. I was just like, okay, there seems to be enough as long as she doesn't spend crazy amounts of money. But, you know, 10 years becomes 20 years and 20 years becomes 30 years. and The spending never changed. And it's hard yeah. to tell your, it's hard to teach your uh, 45, 50 year old uh, parent that they're on a budget. And yeah. I well, just that, never that, was. Yeah, that, that's like that's like the the first thing a financial advisor asks you is like what what's your what are your spending goals or what what are you trying to invest for right not kind of like hey yeah. and I was just scared to hand her to somebody because she would have been conned yeah and 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 and, and, and why, why didn't you buy Apple? It was right there in Forrest Gump he told you to buy Apple I mean it was, uh, I just did I kept such high cash because she didn't have, you know what I mean I had to okay. frame my strategy of trying to make as much so I definitely frame my strategy about. She, she ended up obviously eventually owning Apple, but my strategy was so much about, okay, 70% cash and I'll risk 30% of it and try and make as much money as I can. So it slowly evolved into my strategy of today, which is very much framed by like scaredy cat momentum, meaning I believe in momentum, but I also believe in high cash. So, so, uh, so let's, let's get uh, kind of like into your investment style now and to, um, you write a lot on on on, uh, on your blog, um, and you're very active on Twitter and StockTwits, and founder of StockTwits. Um, and people follow you in your recommendations, and you have this framework called eight to eighty. Um, can you just explain what eight to eighty means in just your general investment style? Yeah, I'll give you two things. Because my general investing style is 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 because I have to treat it like a game. Uh, the my general thing is the markets just completely rigged. So, so from that very first time I lost money from the fact that I had an answer to all my wins and losses because it affected me, you know, how much I would have to eventually support, you know, my mom and, and trying to extend the runway as long as possible and do it part time. Right. Cause it was just like I had a job, um, is the, um, idea of momentum. Right. So it wasn't eight to eight. The idea was like, okay, relative strength. I was inspired early by uh, William O'Neill and relative strength, et cetera, et cetera. So I was always like, that made sense to me. You know, someone who didn't have access to Bloomberg or whatever, it just like stocks with high relative strength and uptrends uh, made sense to me. You were always at least in the names that were talked about um, and they were liquid. And, and um, so that's kind of the strategy is, you know, very simple. Uh, and all the only thing that I've evolved on top of that is I have to really understand the catalyst. So if it's all biotech stocks, it's like I can't be involved because I don't. I get scared out of the first ten percent dip because I don't really know what I own. So it's phase like two, Peter, phase three, phase two. Yeah, all. it's Peter Lynch meets IBD. So it's really a melding of like me, my risk tolerance. Uh, and a little bit of Peter Lynch's influence on top of very high momentum stocks. So, so if you put them all together, the company has to have a catalyst. For me, Apple, you know, 2004 was, I bought an iPad, you know, and, and because I was running my hedge fund not on uh, Windows and not on, you know, DOS and not on Bloomberg, I could use the web. And so when I went into the first Apple store, I'm like, wait a minute, my whole business could be Apple's. And everybody at the time was like, Apple's stupid for opening a store and what's the iPod. But I was so lucky to have a store, Apple store open across the road mm -hmm. from, from my office. I was like one of the first stores at the Biltmore in, in Phoenix. So I'd be in that store every day going, why? Like, this is going to be the greatest comeback in the history. And, and so I got lucky being in that zone and, that started teaching me like Peter Lynch meets a catalyst that nobody knew about. And then when the stock hit an all time high after like coming back, probably had gone up three, 400% before I bought it just to like, like we're going to talk about Farfetch. It probably had already rallied three, four, 500% before I finally bought it at like 10 or $15 because it had been left for dead. And I wasn't scared. I was like, okay, this makes sense to me. Now they have a product that everybody wants. They have these stores 
you know, that I can hang out in and just see all the new products. I had the Apple Genius Bar at the beginning, which was like empty, and you could just talk to Apple people all the time. It was just a miracle. Or you could go to the Gateway or CompUSA, and it would be like going to the third world, you know, yeah, yeah. With, with Windows. So it was just such a layup, and it really combined Peter Lynch, relative strength, and I truly understood the catalyst. And, and, and I've owned Apple ever since, you know. So, so Sorry, you, you always, mentioned you mentioned gateway stores. The, those were the ones with the cows or something. That was like the, yeah, people don't realize it was like you could go to Costco to buy a Packard Bell. Right. You could go, you could order from Dell. You could go to gateway stores. So Apple was 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 mocked for opening retail stores, right, because of the gateway implosion. But what people didn't realize is like, no, yeah, it was a bad pro. It was like. Apple was an experience, like it was the first experience store, right? You could play with your music and you could burn CDs. And it was just like, I just was lucky. And then the white, the white AirPods, like the original white cords, you just started seeing them at your Everywhere, gym, yeah. at your gym. And I'm like, no, this is bigger than people think. And it wasn't even the phone until 2008. So, so anyway, so, so you start, so I just started doing that in regular life, whether it was Chipotle's with my daughter or whether it was Google or whether it was Nike, I just started building this list of companies that I owned for a very long time, Starbucks. Um, so it wasn't complicated strategy. Yeah. So it's products that, you know, no product. fundamental work, like literally no fundamental work, except that I live with these brands and my kids live with these brands. Right. And it's, it, it's kind of like if um, it's a product you experience, it's a product that maybe was recommended or someone that is in your, um, uh, is in your immediate uh, network raves about, and you're just like, hey, if there's going to be 3,000 Chipotle's that are going to open up over the next five years, I don't have to know what the valuation or the margins are in the company. That's, that's yeah, kind of like I'm never that. worried about it. Like, and the hardest part of my strategy has been evolving it. Luckily, you know, the market kind of takes care of it themselves, evolving it to a digital world. When do you give up on Disney to buy Twilio or to buy a di purely digital brand? And I think COVID has been the biggest change in the last 20 years. No, sorry, 2008, 2009, the move from financial leverage to social leverage, which helped me start our, our, our first private investing. And then the next big change uh, is, is, is uh, COVID because this is, this was the trend that was happening and now it's accelerating, right? It's very hard to say, okay, I still love Nike, but Peloton and Lulu, if I'm only going to own one fitness company, I got to own the all digital one because yeah. they don't have, they have higher margins. They have easier uh, way to build a brand and they have global distribution without all the headaches and they can do everything that Nike does over time. But I don't have the headaches of being a land-based business. And, um, you know, having China and all these other problems and supply chains. So it's like, it's, I think, I don't think people understand how bifurcated this market. I think you can see it, you know, flash forward to today, you see it, right? QQQ goes up every day and, and, and the big five stocks are 50% of the QQQ and only 25% of the S and P, but I'd still rather own the remaining QQQ companies than the, than the 490 S and P companies, because Margins, uh, uh, margins, scale, AWS versus, you know, paying landlords, you know. So it's been a really complicated process trying to mentally go 100% digital. But if you want the best returns for your least amount of money, um, you have to be almost 100% digital. Because I don't understand the catalyst other than financial leverage. Uh, for land-based businesses. And I hate leverage, as I said earlier. I just don't, under, I've never really felt comfortable with leverage. And that's right, so, it. Right, so it's like, what's the bull case on Wells Fargo? What's that? You know, what's that? I don't believe their numbers. I think the retail strategy is dumb. I, uh, their customers don't love them. And they can't even use the latest tech because 50% of their customers still demand mail to open their statements. Like it's a perfect storm of shit. Right. Like there's there's nothing but negative catalysts. Like 
And it's not even their fault at some level. They're servicing customers in the middle of the country that still want to open their statements by paper. How do you win? Like right. their old customers are killing them. So they can't even be modern. So they're a mix of mo like, so you see what happens. Like what is something that 50% of their customers still demand stagecoach? Their logo is a stagecoach. Right. <laughs> you know, that's enough, that's enough of a short investment thesis for you. You know what I mean? And then it's just like, then finally you see Warren Buffett finally giving up, but like he only is comfortable owning Apple because that's a product that at least he's using, right? He can't get comfortable with Minecraft and Microsoft and Azure and you know what I mean? Like he, it's a whole new book that he's never learned. Yeah. And cool. Um, that's awesome. So, uh, thanks for that, for that, uh, background investment style. Uh, why don't we get into talking about some specific ideas and just talking about the yeah. market. So I will share my screen. Hold on a sec. And so just quickly while you're doing that, my yeah. general idea is, you know, the, my eight to 80 companies are these humongous brands and they're not very exciting and they can't possibly be growing like they were when they were 50 billion or $10 billion companies. But I'd like to own these brands when the market's in turmoil. And then my real strategy, which isn't, you know, which is, has a lot more risk is trying to find 10, you know, five to $10 million brands, but I've kind of settled in around $10 million companies that could be worth a hundred billion. I think, you know, I, you know, the assumption I now go into the markets is besides that it's rigged is that everything's overvalued. Anything that I could possibly think is interesting to me, every ticker that I pull up, I assume is 50 to 70% overvalued because of the world we live in. So, so part of the game is don't play it if you can't get over those two basic humps, right? And I think a lot of people are kidding themselves because they don't, they're not really honest about the entry level stakes of being a single stock investor. So I fundamentally believe that every stock I own is 50 to 70% overvalued based on how the world is working. And I have to like, you know, me mentally, you know, adjust my portfolio positions to understand that, that the, the rug can be pulled at any time like March. And, and so the way that you adjust for that is in your position sizing or the, yeah. the just, just I try and, and I don't mind having as high a beta as possible. Uh, I don't want to own the most overvalue, but I try and uh, understand that this portfolio of 10 or 15 or 20 momentum stocks, you know, $10 billion companies on the way to a hundred billion are going to be extremely volatile. So position size accordingly. Got it. Okay. That's, that's, that's really good advice. Uh, all right. So let me, let's turn off our videos. It'll make it a little bit easier. Oh, sorry. Yeah. That's okay. All right, so I want to start out with, uh, before we get into like your specific ideas, I wanted to start out with uh, kind of just looking at how the sectors are doing. So I'm here on the sector analysis. I'm going to pull up all the sectors here with the S&P 500. Um, so over here, a little to the right. Um, and so year to date, you have tech, you have uh, consumer discretionary, which Amazon is a huge chunk of, so it's skewed by Amazon. Uh, and communication, uh, communications, which is like Google. So kind of the big tech plays. Um, and you have energy and financials, as we mentioned, uh, is near the bottom as well as something that really can't catch a bid uh, and something that's uh, that's been like. So any, um, any, any so you, you're, you're kind of like positioned in the sectors over here, the ones that are leading year to date and your view is that they're going to continue to be leading. Yeah, from a macro view, I think medical instruments, which I don't know the sector, so I use the IHI as a proxy, but mm -hmm. uh, medical instruments, healthcare, tech, and within tech, mostly software. Yeah, so that, that gets us to, so if I um, get rid of these U.S. sectors and I pull up the U.S. industries, and I don't think we have um, med med tech in here. Which well, that's QQQ. That's to me, it's QQQ. Uh, so, so I meant IHI, like the med tech one. Um, well, IHI is, is um, medical instruments. Got it. Okay, got it. Very um, narrow. Very narrow, like uh, the Medtronics of the world and ResMed. And... Got it. So, so here, if we look at um, year to date, so clean energy is actually the top performing uh, at least in the industries yeah. that we show. But as, because, as I, I, because I have no understanding of it, uh, I just... I just Again, so, so I always eliminate things that, because if they're down 20%, I don't, I don't follow policy. I don't follow politics. I don't follow, 
I can't, if I can't understand the company or sector, why even own it? Got it. So, so these, this is probably, um, is a play or this is probably working in anticipation because the Democrat, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's been beautiful. Like Ivan and I go through this weekly and, and if you look at first solar, even the laggard in that industry, it's on fire and solar edge. So I know all the names. I just like, you know, because I see them on the, on the list all the time from tan to solar edge to, um, uh, Ivan keeps mentioning them, but even for solar breaking up, but I just, you know, just tells me that the, that maybe on a, on a, on a tremendous sell-off, I may trade a couple of them, but I don't, I don't really plan on owning it. Right. So solar edge is the biggest one. And if I pull this up in lots of charts and just looking through the charts of all the stuff, I have tan, go market cap, high to low. Yeah. So ENPH for solar. I mean, first solar looks incredible to me, but I've been disappointed by that stock so many times. And because I don't really, you know, it's a Phoenix company and, and, but I've been, it's been, it's just, you know, if that breaks out above 80 for solar, that could really go. Right. right. You know, but I've, I've been there so many times and I, it's always, I just, I, I think there's stuff that I just don't get about the industry. And so I just can't, I just don't play. Yeah. So you just see better opportunities elsewhere. It's not even about better opportunities because that would be a lie. I mean, obviously, Enphase has been phenomenal and Solar Edge has been phenomenal, and I've, I've I've tried to own them, but it just doesn't get me excited. I don't understand the full catalyst. I do understand the sun. Like, so if I was going to buy it, I would buy T A N, but I would always feel like I'm never really going to dig into it because I don't give a shit. Got it. So it'd be more like a thematic ETF play. Yeah. And then, um, you know, one of my, uh, one of our users asked me to ask um, our guests, how do you think about investment time horizon? Like when you think about a trade, are you putting it on for three months? Are you putting it on for 12 months? Um, like how, and, and obviously it, it'll probably depend, but what, what factors determine your, your time horizon? Yeah, I always try and just use the verbiage investment just because I'm okay with an investment becoming a trade. And, but I'm, you know, the idea is not to let a trade become an investment. So, so I start out by just trying to say everything I do is an investment and with the hope of it being forever, like the next Apple, right? Or I'll trade around it, but, or invest around it. But, you know, hopefully I, the catalyst is something that is so vanilla down the middle of the plate that it's just never going to be fully appreciated. And, you know, uh, so, you know, founder led, um, generally software, uh, has been like the two key things that have changed since, you know, 2008 and that's the era of social leverage over financial leverage. But so I'm, you know, and then if I trade, it's usually based on swing trading, meaning it can be a hot sector. It could be solar edge where the market uh, pulls back very hard and leading stocks pull back, I'll, I'll, I'll swing trade once in a while, which is, you know, I'll try and hold something for, I'll, I'll go in knowing it may only be a five day hold because I don't really love the sector. I don't really have any really belief in the stock, but, uh, uh, but, but because I know institutions will, will trade it at certain points, but it'll be on my list. So, so like this, you might like in a, you might, I don't know if you draw these channels, but this could be like a pretty, Y channel and you're saying if it pulls back to here. Correct. Especially if it's the market is the reason it's pulling back. If it's stock specific, it'll just, I, it's not good for me. But if the market pulls back 10%, I'll look for the stocks that were in the best uptrend that uh, are down with the market and try and reduce it to the companies I really feel like I can understand. So, like, so, so uh, that'll give me an edge over all the other traders at least. And so I don't get scared out on further blips. Uh, so, so kind of like uh, using this William O'Neill concept of, of relative strength or relative performance and making sure that it's, it's a leader. Yes. Relative to but if, if that was the only relative leader and, but if the, if solar edge is up against, you know, Twilio or, or Apple or uh, even Nike or a company that, or Starbucks, a brand that I fully understand or Zillow, I'm going to stick with, the brands I understand. Yeah, right. Got it. Kind of um, 
we have where you have more of a fundamental or uh, yeah. thematic view on this stuff. So let's let's get into you mentioned software. Let's get into your first kind of uh, software name. Was it Elastic? Well, the first about? one would be Spotify. Sorry, I know we weren't prepared. I don't know. Can we can we improvise with Spotify? We, we, we could do whatever. This is this is your 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 gig. Yeah, yeah. so we could do Spotify. So, so Spotify and Apple are like t going back and forth between my two largest positions, and 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 um, Spotify. I just feel like again, assuming everything's overvalued. And assuming that everybody knows that music is a terrible business and there's lots of competition, um, that's just a given. If you, you mentioned I'm long Spotify; it's the number one position. People are going to roll their eyes and go, "Wow, you know they don't make any money off music, and the artists hate them, and there's ten cent music and Apple music." And I say, "Yeah." And and when I used to talk about Apple back in the day, it would be the same thing. You know, there's Gateway and there's Dell and you know, blah, 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 blah. But the, the price of Spotify has changed. The, the trajectory of how uh, Wall Street and institutional money flowing into the stock has changed. I Meaning that's an old story. And when the stock got above 160, I started writing about, you know, I've loved Spotify forever, but now's the time to own it. Um, combined with why the market was giving it a higher price, which was, it's all about the podcast, right? Whether podcasts are going to be big or small, you have a tailwind of the market saying, this isn't about music anymore. This is about them having a 250 million user platform and they're committing to podcasts. So if podcast is big, they're going to own this. By the time Apple catches them, it'll be too late, you know? Um, so I think, Spotify is just one of those leaders. And then combined with the fact, you know, it was a $30 billion company uh, and I felt it can be a $200 billion brand. So this goes into another theme that I have is in, in a period of you know, endless money printing and global fractional ownership of shares. And the fact that there's going to be 500 Robin Hoods around the world is these American cultural digital icon brands uh, are never going to be valued what you think because they have just they have limited supply of stock it's almost like gold at some level right mm -hmm. like spotify some at some levels digital gold because there's only one spotify and um so so i start then looking at market cap and you see the enterprise value is a little bit uh, nauseating at 48 billion but i believe at 30 billion i'd be a buyer and at 200 billion i'm a seller so so i've got four to one, you know, kind of upside. Right. right. And so to me, it's just a long, you know, it's just put enough cash in it, maybe add a little more cash into the stock if it drops 20% uh, and the market drops 20%. But I'm holding this for, you know, to be a 150 to $250 billion brand. And so I'm, I'm comfortable owning it unless the company itself starts screwing up or if a competition comes on and becomes better at podcasting than them and takes it more seriously than them. But right now I think unless the market crashes and then the other thing we know is that if COVID carries on and the market crashes because of COVID, we know that the stock is not going to get as hurt relatively because it's already kind of the markets kind of watched it through COVID and the numbers went up. So so anyway, so that's that's my favorite. The the next one is. Uh, and so, hold on, before you move on to that, I just added, uh, I added a, a a revenue estimate number to the stock. So this is kind of the revenue estimate over the next twelve months, right. uh, and it's got this this really nice uptrend. Um, and it can only surprise, in my opinion. I don't know if I believe that number, but if it's going to surprise, it's going to surprise on the high side because they're going to be dominating. They're going to have all this. Uh, inventory of podcasts like my podcast that's where i push it so you know it's, there's a million howard lindsons doing podcasts it's they're only going to upside surprise on the upside yeah and D uh daniel Eck is is another uh is a very impressive ceo he was on yeah founder uh, ceo founder ceo yeah he was on, mm -hmm. on uh, patrick's uh, that's like the best podcast and yeah really really impressive yep um okay yeah. spotify who, uh what's next I guess Elastic is breaking out today and I've been kind of preempting that forever just because I'm biased because the product's so good. Um, so let me just hide this. We'll hide this just to 
Um, so this is this is a th this is actually similar to kind of what Spotify did uh, when it broke above the the 160 level that you talked about here. Let me just pull it up here just for for reference on a on a technical basis where the company IPO'd. It was trading sort of in this range, had this really strong uh, resistance, and then broke above this resistance on news of. Uh, I think this yeah. was the podcasting thing. So you have a similar, you have a similar yeah. thing. So with the right last, now. they've been chopped around in that meaning. You know, uh, it was, like I said, it was always, in my opinion, overvalued because it's open, it's, um, open source software. So Mongo, Elastic, Okta, um, trying to think of some other ones uh, um, that have done nothing but go up. Okay. So Elastic's kind of maybe because it was always overvalued. It's a Dutch company, uh, Dutch founders. Uh, it's an open source software company. And, and what's interesting about when I bought this one, I didn't wait for all-time highs. I, I definitely have owned it and then got stopped out in the 70s or 60s pre-March. Um, you know, I got stopped out of that last year. And and then in April this year, I just, you know, went in the, in the crash. I was looking at it, I'm like, that's impossible that it's down there at uh, 40. So it when it filled its gap in the 60s in you know, I don't know, May or June is, I said, listen, that's obviously that was just part of the liquidity crash. And I got pretty excited and I put on a position there and wrote about it a bunch. And, um, you know, the last few days I've been adding kind of preempting this breakout, their earnings are next week. So, you know, this stock could still be 70 next week, uh, because it's overvalued, but this is a company that truly, has taken on for the last two years. And, and so the other thing here is because they're open source software, um, there's always gonna be, you know, for the last few years, it's been Amazon's coming for them, you know, mm -hmm. because Amazon uh, is getting into the same product, right? And the difference is though, as we've learned, it creates a lot of headaches. If you pull up MongoDB, MDB, you'll see the same thing when Amazon announced that they were gonna do what Mongo's doing with their AWS product. Mongo, a couple of years ago had a, uh, uh, spike down. Um, so this was this right here. No, it, it spiked oh. down in like beginning oh. of 2019, April 2019. Uh, you know, there was oh. just this this year of like going nowhere uh -huh. when Amazon, you know, was the feared uh, competitor. Mm -hmm. And um, but you can see all the enterprise stock where in April all the enterprise stock where stocks kind of got panicked out of, and it was kind of the last good opportunity. So if we go back to Elastic, they power like stock twit search, Uber search, they power like all, if you're looking up a ticker. We use um, the McCoythin. Okay, so you use the McCoythin. So, so people don't realize that like, that is such a powerful tool and, and Coythin's never gonna give that up, right? You know, theoretically Amazon could come to you one day, but they're never gonna offer you you know, to try and get all your business and give you a discount on AWS. So I think there's always going to be that drag of Amazon, but Amazon just, you know, just can't fight everybody. Right. So, um, so here we go. Elastic's breaking out. It's only a $10 billion company. This could be easily be a, a, a 80 to a hundred billion dollars, uh, open source software brand. Right. Okay. Depending on how markets want to value it. So, so I love finding these companies that are, you know, 10 billion ish breaking out software, open source, you know, 90%, 95% gross margin businesses. Uh, and the catalyst here is no one really under, takes the time to, to understand what Elastic does, which is, you know, powering tens of thousands of the most uh, uh, visited sites uh, so that you can do search on them. And, yeah. um, and, 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 we pay, and, we, and we can't afford to not, not pay them their monthly fee or our sites won't work. Yeah. And, and for us, uh, the benefit that we get from Elastic is it allows you to search um, unstructured data or data that just kind of like is all together in one, uh, in one big pile. And it does it very quickly. And so you don't, so kind of like, um, I don't know if Google uses Elasticsearch, but the, the reason, you know, the fact that you can type in something in Google and it's right there. Uh, the fact that you can start typing something into Coifin, it's right there. The fact that you can start typing something into Stockwoods, it's right there. 
that's the power of it, whereas the, the previous kind of search algorithms uh, were very slow. It would take several seconds to do that. Yeah, so, so this is one that has endless upside, right? It's just you've got to understand that it's overvalued. And, and the work you have to do is actually when you, you have to call around to, to startups and see if they're using Elastic, right? Like you don't have to wait for an ad. You just have to make sure that the customers are staying with them. Like if you call me up and said, we, we're not we're switching from Elastic and StockTwitch is switching from Elastic, I'd want to know because if the startups are switching, I'd want to know what the better product is. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So you're not going to get your information from Wall Street here because you should do this yourself. You call around CEOs of like startups, like, and what are they using for search? Right. Um, so, uh, so it's an exciting company. Very exciting company. So, so when you say overvalued, you you probably like does that mean richly valued? Yes, meaning how do you fundamentally was it twenty times revenue? What's what, what's the it's, it's right here fifteen so, so, times. So, so, so about fifteen times next year. Is, yeah. Uh, so meaning if 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 Elastic was a private company, not public yet, and 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 someone came to me and said we're going to pay you fifteen times sales, I'd sell the stock. So only because it's liquid will I own something at fifteen times sales. Now I you know I have to tell you that that's like at least. 50% overvalued in a normal world, in my opinion. Right. So when, and that's why what happened in March, where did the stock drop? 60, 70%. So, so you have to understand that technically this stock breaking out doesn't excite me as much as this stock down 50%, because if 50%, it gets closer to, this is why value stocks are dying because Elastic will never be really fairly valued, but when it drops 40% and the technicals look terrible, is a better time to buy these, you know? Yeah, that, make, that makes a lot of sense. Which um, meaning, generally I like to buy all-time highs, but I was buying Elastic in the 60s because I was like, okay, I understood that it wasn't going to zero and it wasn't because I lost customers. So it's a little less overvalued than it will be at all-time highs right now. So I can buy it. And this is why value is dead because all the money is moving into this strategy, which is a weird type of value in software companies. It's kind of market driven liquidity value versus actual company execution value. So it's just, you know, anything you learned, this is why these young kids are having so much fun. It's like, they don't have to go learn PE and you know what I mean? All these old rules. And, and the old people are mad because, oh, they're, they're dumb. They're buying. And, well, as long as they buy the right companies and all this money eventually is going to come around to how Davy Barstool and guys like us invest in the market because it's software, high margin, global mobile social opportunities. And um, many more young founder-led businesses because they – because uh, – because because of the, how lean these companies can be. They don't have to do acquisitions to grow. Like the pre, you know, the pre 2010 world, the world was built by the conglomerates and through acquisitions, you know, through financial leverage in this post uh, financial leverage world. Um, businesses are built on customers being everywhere and being able to onboard them very simply and to have your costs scale like Amazon prime instead of buying leases and apartment buildings and buying companies and people. So right. and, and, and elastic, these... elastic looks really interesting to me. That could easily be a 30 to $50 billion uh, company. Right. And so in the last quarter, they grew revenue at 57%. Um, and then for, and then for, you know, for uh, the next couple of years, let's look at the, the revenue growth uh, slowing down to, to 25%, but still yeah. growing very, very quickly. Right. But there's a lot of negativity built into these numbers, I think, because of the Amazon threat, you know, so right. we have to. Right. So the, the stock's going to be volatile. That growth is not you need to see higher growth for that stock to surprise. And so, like I said, the earnings are next week. This could be a $70 stock, which I would buy unless there was some fundamental reason or it'd be a $150 stock and I'll hold. Uh, and I'll hold my nose because I know it's overvalued, but the stock could easily be, like I said, a 30 to $50 billion open source brand. Okay. okay. What, um, what's the next stock you want to talk about? I think the last one, well, let's go with Farfetch because again, it fits my profile of why it's interesting. 
doing some work on, I own a few shares. Um, and so, so again, it's, it's a scary chart for anybody that uh, prides himself on buying low and selling high. Um, so what do they a, do? So Farfetch from what I'm hearing from their customers and from what I've read is it's no different than Amazon. They, they are a platform or, or Etsy or Shopify at some level. They are a brand, uh, a website, a platform that allows high end uh, fashion brands to sell their products. Right. And I think, you know, they went public. It was a big, big, big deal, but they've always walked this tightrope of do, should they sell their own brands? Should they buy brands? Uh, or should they be uh, just a platform for the best of the best uh, fashion brands? Mm -hmm. And so I think they've always had to walk this tightrope of um, what should they do? And then COVID happened, right? And um, I think, I believe what happened, and again, the numbers and the stock price say this, is that because of COVID, these brands that were fighting with them and didn't want to put themselves on Farfetch now have this, this e-commerce wave hit them where they had no choice, right? They own one or two high-end fashion retail stores and they're fucked. They can't sell anything, right? right? And they don't know how to, uh, and so the ones that want to stay in business and, and want to keep their fashion brands alive, uh, Farfetch now does the, comes to your studio, uh, does the photo shoots, does all the uploading, does all the shipping. So basically the designers can keep doing what they do and uh, Farfetch at least gives them a platform to sell their stuff and build their brand. So I'm hearing from many of my friends that are in the fashion industry that over the last month, they've been uploading all their, their stuff to Farfetch. Now what Farfetch gets out of that is they're aggregating people that love buying expensive overpriced, you know, shoes, mm -hmm. shirts, you know, and, and and from around the world. So so Farfetch has every Chinese person theoretically that likes to spend a hundred thousand dollars a year on the most whack, expensive clothes, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's great for the the smaller fashion brand because now they're bringing customers, right? And those customers like expensive fashion items, and it's great for Farfetch because now they have more inventory to sell. So it's kind of one of those win-win-win platforms that is evolving because of uh, a change in circumstances, which is COVID. And so here you have a company that um, was, you know, iffy, but is coming out of COVID stronger than any of the other fashion companies, right? None of the other fashion stocks look like Farfetch. So there's something going on there that's good. Um, it's hitting that 10 billion valuation, which is where like these momentum, you know, uh, funds start looking at it, you know, and Shopify itself was a $10 billion company, um, two, three years ago. Mm -hmm. And all Farfetch is, 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 is that type of platform for, for a global, uh, and it, this is global because this is brands and customers from around the world. So it's kind of like a very high end Etsy or a very high end Amazon. So I think the, the market doesn't really understand how big this opportunity is. And, and, and I guess the, I guess the big question of if, if, if COVID goes away tomorrow, uh, will habits go back and will we be going to the corner fashion shows stores in LA and New York and Miami, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, or will the, the, or will the um, fashion people like to still use Farfetch? Um, so, you know, it's one that's interesting to me. That's a new idea. Yeah, and so, so just looking at, at the snapshot, uh, thing that catches my eye is that really high short interest yep. at 10.8%. Yep. So like you said, a lot of people before were, were negative on the stock. So let me just pull up the, uh, the main chart versus the short interest, just so we could see it. Oops. Um, and so the stock has not done well into COVID, but because COVID is just a, a whole new different ball game, the yeah. stock has rallied as yeah. brands have, have offloaded their inventory and relied and need to rely on Farfetch to make the sale. Uh, yeah. And this number hasn't come down, which is, which is actually pretty bullish because 
if the stock market exactly. does start coming down, that's the buy. That's why value. I bought some. Oh, dude, this stock could go to 100 in an hour, right? Because, and here's the other thing about brands like this. Amazon's not going to buy it at 10 billion. But would Amazon pay 100 billion if they totally win the sector? Yes. So, so this, this, there's a lot of companies at the 8 to $20 billion market cap that, and Peloton was one of them, you know, six months ago, where um, once, they, once they break out, you know, it becomes, you know, they could, you know, you're trying to figure out who the next big planets are going to be, like the 10 or 20 companies that could get together and challenge the FANG stocks. Uh, for market cap dominance and Tesla just broke in there with a $300 billion market cap. So you're trying to find these companies that can go from 10 to a hundred billion because they're going to do so under the watch of Amazon, Google, Netflix, uh, et cetera. But once they get to a certain point, uh, they also could get bought for these crazy numbers because, you know, the five big planets have to make sure they protect their borders and right now, Farfetch is going to get away with a lot because Amazon's not going to copy their business model yet at a 10 billion valuation. It's not worth them worrying about it. Uh, yeah. And I, and Go I, ahead. And sorry, I just pulled up the chart of Farfetch versus uh, relative to iBuy, which is the online retail ETF. Uh, okay. And you've also had a pretty interesting outperformance, relative performance since the oh. COVID. Okay. And then the other thing I would say is there's other stocks in that se sector that are, are not doing well. Stitch Fix, um, which I, you know, originally was one of my ideas, but it just, it's just, it's a harder business to run and it's not doing as well as, uh, as, um, as Farfetch. All right. So here, oops, if we do, we just look at the small charts here. Um, so Amazon obviously doing well, a lot of charts here. And then if we go to the, to the charts that uh, aren't doing so, where's, uh, so, we don't have. so it's, it's like, if you look at Wayfair, that's what I feel so, so a Farfetch could do. Wayfair and Farfetch look the same to me. Like Wayfair continues to, to surprise people in the home, uh, outdoor furnishing area, the high end or middle of the road height furnishing area, right? Meaning if you look at a chart pattern, uh, it went from what, 25 to 150. Mm -hmm. And so I look at Wayfair going, okay, if it does, if it breaks out from 115 to 150, I'm looking at Wayfair out farfetch thinking it has the same type of possible move with a couple of good earnings reports because it solidify itself as a platform leader for the, post-COVID e-commerce world. Got it. So, so kind of like here, uh, Wayfair bounced up to the support, to this resistance level. And look how it, quickly it did it. Look how quickly it did it. Because the world changed, right? Restoration hardware was kicking its ass. Right. Um, so I'm just trying to, you know, put together stories that could be very big stories. You know, I'm not trading for $1 or $5. I'm trading for hundreds of points. Cool. Interesting. Um, as, um, let's, let's wrap it up with, um, uh, I'll give you two other ones, pags two. and stone stone and pags, which are kind of like the okay. visa, mastercard, PayPal square of Latin America all rolled into one, you know, it's just like, who's gonna, who's gonna win Latin America, right? There's Mercado Libre. There's, XP, there's PAGs and there's stone. So PAGs interest me in stone, you know, uh, meaning, you know, Brazil and, and Latin America continue to be very volatile, you know, places to invest. But if I'm going to own, you know, what I think are the most important type of infrastructure plays, which are uh, uh, FinTech of Latin America, um, these are the two companies that kind of come to mind. I've been long for a while and I treat these more like venture capital. So I'd rather buy them when they're down 40% um, because, uh, you know, uh, the countries are, you know, the, the, the region of the world is so volatile, right? Politically and economically that, you know, it's not like buying uh, growth stocks in the U S you know, because, but, but here you have these companies kind of breaking out uh, finally 
and uh, they're, they're much cheaper than their U.S. counterparts, you know, on all kinds of metrics. But they do the exact same thing that Square and PayPal does, but for their own countries. So on dips, which is where I prefer them on big dips, is, you know, Square, MasterCard, Visa, uh, banks, they're buyers of these companies, right? That's the, there's a floor on these companies because uh, they'll get bought by the U.S. leaders. Um, so it's kind of just a different view of how I look at tech around the world. With the, there's so many buyers of these companies on weakness. Uh, and, you know, but you also don't mind owning them when they're trending up because, you know, these are the right businesses and the, these are the right businesses to be in for an e-commerce digital world, which are the processors and the squares of the world. And, and, and this 10, 10 billion market cap is, is the sweet spot. of where I am. Yeah, it's into my worldview. You know, and Latin America is just a massive, you know, e-commerce opportunity. These people aren't going to have wired, you know, they, they want e-commerce. So uh, these can be 30, 40 billion dollar companies. Cool. Awesome. Well, a lot of, a lot of good information, a lot of good ideas there. Uh, I want to wrap it up with uh, two things. One is how can, what's the best way for people to follow you and follow your ideas? Uh, the easiest way is my blog, howardlinson.com. I have a free email every morning I send out uh, early and it's about trends and markets, stuff like this. And then on uh, stock twits, geez, that's where I share what I'm doing. You know, I don't, I don't like yell out ideas, but these are the companies that I generally follow and talk about. Um, but I'm not going to tell you what to do. I just share, I tell people what I'm doing and then on Twitter as well. Got it. Cool. Okay, and, uh, we'll, we'll and then focus. I have a podcast, uh, twice a week called panic with friends and you can go to Spotify and subscribe. Cool. Awesome. And then, um, uh, one last thing is since COVID, a lot of us have been, uh, watching, uh, more movies than, than previously on Netflix and stuff like that. Uh, what's the favorite, what's your favorite movie or TV show uh, that you've seen since uh, COVID or over the past year? TV shows for sure. Uh, halt and catch fire. Uh, -huh. uh second place. I liked, uh, Yellowstone. Um, what is Halt and Catch Fire about? I've never Halt and Catch Fire is the story of it's a it's um, what do you call it? It's a drama and and not it's a bit of a fabrication in terms of the storytelling. But it's the era of computing from 1980 to to almost today. So it's four seasons and it's just a fun you know uh, tell the ups and downs of the computer industry from you know the original clone PCs all the way through the internet. And you'll recognize the people that are kind of uh, memorializing from, from uh, you know, Michael Dell to, to Bill Gates to Mark Andreessen, but through uh, dramatic storytelling. And it's just a great cast of characters. Great, it's just phenomenal. Cool. And I think every investor will love it because it really kind of explains the computer industry. So you're kind of getting educated and, and, and historical look at what went on without actually pinning it on any one company. It's kind of like an amalgamation. Got it. Cool. That sounds, that sounds really cool. So it reminds yeah, me on Netflix you can, It's originally on AMC, but it's on Netflix. Cool. We'll definitely check it out. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, Howard, uh, for all these ideas and your time. Uh, looking forward to seeing uh, more stuff on, on your blog and Twitter and uh, talk to you soon. Thanks, Ron.